today about the importance of designers, developers, managers working very closely together and how UX is everyone's job. Before I start, how many designers are in the room? Okay, and developers? And okay, and other other roles? Okay, so it's kind of nicely balanced uh, the other small developers. This talk is for everyone, as you can see. I organized a, a monthly event called UX Oxford and um, as an organizer and as a speaker in events like this one, I end up talking with a lot of designers and developers, meeting up for coffees and exchanging mails. And one of the problems I see is that um, one of the problems I see I hear very often is that um, the project, they don't have a concept of the project's team. The way they work is designers, developers, they are quite apart from each other in different departments. So for example, in some companies, there is a sales team or account managers that are the only ones who meet the client. And then they go back to the, to the designer with a very specific creating lots of Photoshop files, like for every screen, and delivering to the developer um, with annotated PDFs for them to create like a pixel perfect design. <coughs> then you end up having problems like the developers feeling frustrated because the designs they have uh, they given are flawed and doesn't work. And on the other side, designers feeling that their designs were not well implemented. And it's really frustrating. So what happens is there is a delivery process between the designers and developers, uh, like managers, uh, designers and developers. And this process is inefficient and can be frustrating for everyone because it, it means that you are not creating the best you can. And alongside to that, Project managers feeling that their team don't get ownership for the, the tasks they were given. So it ends up having a lot of us and them. And it's not a very motivating way of working. Because you don't know the impact of your part uh, in the project. You don't know how much value you're adding towards the, the outcome, the, the ending point. And sometimes you don't even know who you're working with. But the reality is, we've all been there. We've all worked in this way. That's how we use it to work. And there are, my surprise that there are still lots of companies and agencies working this way. The more complex the projects are, and our projects are getting, are becoming more complex, the more we need different perspectives from di di uh, different disciplines. So designing, developing isolation is not an option anymore. We need to work together. As a web industry, uh, with ideas like Agile and Lean Startup, we have learned and we are learning better as a way of working to develop better digital product products, better user experiences, and more efficient processes. And, and a very exciting way of working is in multidisciplinary teams or cross-functional teams, where there is true collaboration, where everyone contributes towards one goal, which is to create high-quality products. I love working this way with different, you know, with people from different perspectives, and I'm quite passionate about the topic. So that's how it looks. Everyone working the pro everyone working that project are contributing, discussing, brainstorming on a regular basis, on a daily basis, and sometimes multiple times a day. Developers and designers are sketching together. We are discussing around whiteboards, and developers are also coming to the user research 
to observe the use of its testing. And there is no concept of delivery between designers and developers because they're all working together. We know what you're working on. So it's a very motivating way of working. It creates really good relationship between the team. There are some challenges, of course, and I'm, I'll, I'll get you to that. So this is what I'm going to talk today. I'm going to talk about project teams, interdis interdisciplinary teams, their roles in the UX product cycle. I'm going to talk about the UX, some UX techniques to get the team involved and the team collaborating. And it's communication, verbal communication, and it's online tools to allow communication between members. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the company I work for, so you understand the context with that I'm working in. I'm head of design at Oxford Computer Consultants, which is a 60-person software company based in Oxford, England. We design and develop software, web, and mobile apps for clients, and we also have our own products, software products. We work with a variety of clients, but mostly with engineering, science, health, and social care. What motivates us is complex work, complex in terms of data and uh, proper uh, technical challenges and design challenges. So we are a group of people who love challenges. We work with agile and lean methodologies, but we also work in projects that work like following waterfall methodologies. We have developers, software engineers, designers, project managers, account managers, support teams, and training. Our project teams are quite small ones. Usually there is a designer, some developers, an account manager, and a project manager. We all sit in the same, in an open office, quite near to each other. So at any point you can stand up and go to someone's desk and, and discuss some ideas with them. We don't work in pods, uh, like always with the same team, because we work on several projects at the same time, and we like variety. So working different teams allow us to learn from each other, because di people, different people have different skills. We work very closely with our clients, and the clients become part of the team. The role of the designer has changed in the past years, the past years from to now. Uh, we are not to only work in isolation anymore, like behind the screen, but the role of the designer is to facilitate conversations between people in the team, to talk about users, and to get everyone to think about users. Most of, of my time nowadays is you know, standing at a whiteboard, discussing with someone some ideas, or at someone's desk, sketching with them, or at a client's meeting, facilitating discussions, or with users uh, in the field. <coughs> I really like this tweet by the user researcher Caroline uh, Jarrett. User researcher's fallacy, my job is to learn about users, whereas the truth, is my job is to help my team learn about users. So we need to facilitate this conversation. And the good thing, the benefit is that you bring part to the team. So the developers and everyone knows what they are building before they actually start building, which is much more, it is, it's a very efficient way of working. So one of the things that were mentioned in our project retrospectives was that the developers knew what they, they had clarity, they knew what they were going to build before they started the work. <coughs> in English, the government is uh, giving a very good example of creating great user experience. They're doing a great job at redesigning all the government's websites to focus on user needs. And this is one of their guidelines. Like user research is a team sport. 
So everyone is impacting on the user experience. User experience is something that the whole team have the responsibility for. No matter if you, what you have in mind is the technology, or the design, or the business, the support, the training, everything has enough uh, affects the user experience. So that's how the product cycle looks like. At the start of the project, we all meet the clients. So when, they come, when the client comes to our office, they meet the team they are going to work with. So everyone is in this kickoff meeting, discussing the project's briefing, understanding the client's vision, and, and their goal. So if, if you see at the start, there is the whole project team working. Then what happens is you go away, like as a designer or a developer, you need to build your own thing, and then come back to the team again. And that's the cycle, until at some point you are working parallel. So there's a discovery phase, and the discovery phase now is much shorter than it used to be years ago. So we have, you, you're doing things like you defining user groups and doing user flows and sketching and doing quite high level wireframes. Very high level, just key pages and think about the content and layout. And then very soon, you start the design and development <coughs> work in parallel. And that's when you, as a designer, you're creating more detailed wireframes. And the front-end developer and the back-end developer, the back-end developer is doing, is getting the data, and the front-end developer is working with you to get those wireframes finalized in our working prototype. This is one of our design principles at OCC. We need to meet users early and often. Uh, in one of the projects recently, we started the project on a Friday. The next Friday, we're there meeting users. And what, we didn't have anything to show to users at that stage, apart from very rough ideas, but we we're interviewing them and understanding their context. And this brings me to the next point, next thing I want to talk about, which is UX techniques. <coughs> So these are eight, I call, essential UX techniques because I use it most of, of the projects I worked on. Worked on. So this is um, uh, our techniques to understand users, understand them in depth, and also to create, uh, to um, help the collaboration, the communication between people in the team. So we go where the users are. We don't have a lab in our office because we know how important it is to understand to understand the context where the users are working. So we meet them, we talk to them, their natural environment. So this is a project we worked on for a national grid. We went to interview engineers who work at power stations for a tablet app that we were developing. So we spent a day there, and this is who went to the to the user research. So the designer, which is me on the left, the project manager, the account manager, and the developer. So everyone is observing and understanding the user, and it's very important that the developer is there because this was a calculations act for engineers. There is no way. The ideas, all the ideas comes from a designer's mind, because there is so much part, the technical is so important in design. And this was, I used a bit testing we did uh, at Bath and Northeast Somerset Council, which is a local government. And we are testing one of our products for social care. So we went to the local government uh, to test it. The, pro uh, the product to a visually impaired user. We needed to find out how they interact with the software and how the screen reader, JAWS, worked with our software. This is a new user group we needed to uh, support. So this will impact training 
So Paul, who is from training, who was there, because then Paul needs to understand how he's going to train other people, what other people from the same user group. And yeah, and also support. So if, if the users have any problems uh, while using the product, they are going to call support. So the user experience goes beyond the interface. Once we define user groups, the first thing we do is user flows. And user flows are great to bring, bring clarity to the team. So everyone knows what they're building. <coughs> so developers know what they're building before they start the work. Once you start the work, it becomes really expensive for you to, to change anything. And also, in terms of systems design, it's very important that the system design and the user flow are matching, and are nicely aligned. So usually what happens is I go away, I create a draft user flow, so we can see on the board, the user flow there on the whiteboard. <coughs> and to get feedback, I run a very short activity with the team. So in this activity, which I'm calling question missing an idea, I, I explain the user flow and I ask everyone in the team to write in post-its anything that is missing from the flow, any questions that they may have, and any ideas. This is a very efficient way of getting lots of ideas uh, from a group of people. Because what happens if you get to make, you know, uh, call everyone for a meeting and just try to get them to speak, we might very easily uh, lose the focus in the meeting because people go and talk about all, all sorts of things. So this one is very focused because people are writing post-its. And then you end up having things like this. <coughs> On the post-it, a developer, developer, developer uh, asked, no, first, um, what I said there was, at this point, the call to action is the user will print a checklist. And then the post-it says, how would users print using the app? This was a tablet app in a power station. So it doesn't make any sense, does it? So this sounds like it's a state of stupidity here. But in my defense, this app is also a desktop app. So as a desktop, you can quickly print something. And the next, uh, so I went away and I <coughs> thought more about the user flow. And then you, I came back to the team. And in this one, you can see that the user flow are more, is, is more detailed. And there is also some very rough wireframes. So I run the same type of activity to get them like any questions, anything that is that are missing, and any ideas. Post it's a great way to keep people focused. Another UX technique which is very good to um, integrate UX in an agile environment is what's called the product canvas, which is by Roman Pichler. So this is our board. As you can see at the top, you, you, see the, you see the goal of the project. So everyone is focused on, they know what the goal, the final goal of the project is. And then you have the metrics. How are we going to make sure that we are achieving this goal? And the nice thing is that uh, we have daily meetups, uh, like daily stand-up meetings around the whiteboard. So during development, we are always going back to user research and target groups and always referring back to this. And very quickly, you can make sketches just by discussing in one of the meetings. And then on the right-hand side is the normal like, sprint 
um, tasks and strict goal. So another UX technique, which is very simple, is, is sketching. And sketching is a great way to uh, have good collaboration with developers. I really love sketching with developers. But I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about I sketch one thing and, and you go and sketch another thing and we compare. I'm actually talking about sketching together. So we're actually scribbling like on, with, on top of other ones sketches and discussing and get into an agreement. So there is no such a thing as my idea, your idea. We're just working together. And something I like when I share with clients, which I'm happy, very happy to do is sharing the sketches with clients, is I show also an inspiration board. Like I show an example, it's something that's online. So the combination between a sketch and something that is real makes uh, clients understand how it's going to look like if we go in that direction. And for that, to be able to you know, share sketches and to work together, we need to be, feel comfortable sharing and finish the work. And it's something that, uh, it's not something that is natural. If you look at, look back like five or 10 years, when you're like print designers or graphic designers. But we learned that you need to ship it before we, um, we think it's finished. So another UX technique is stakeholder workshop. So this one was uh, in a meeting, client meeting that was about 10, 10 people in the client and us as well. So. So it's quite a large group of people to try to get ideas. So this was after the project was launched and you needed to understand how we can make this product better, what are the, what are the features or the changes and gather requirements. And in client meetings, sometimes you have someone who is very senior and some other people who are not that senior. You have people who are very loud and people who are very quiet, and what you need to do is get everyone to talk at the same level and contribute as equally to that meeting. So a very good way of doing that is by doing post-it exercises. So what you do is you ask everyone to write, like you give about five, 10 minutes, ask everyone to write in post-its um, their ideas on you have a question, how can I include this website or this app? So you do that, and then you ask people to stand up and post on, put on the whiteboard, read their idea, and put on the whiteboard. And then after that, we do dot voting. So we ask people to vote on the one, to vote on the ones that are high priority. So very quickly, in a, you know, 30 minutes to one hour meeting, you get a list of priorities, of requirements, and you can go away and put my spreadsheets and it's done. And another thing that helps a lot in terms of us always improving in terms of process is project retrospectives. This actually comes from Agile, uh, methodology. So, and there is this link with lots of activities, ideas of activities there. So you ask the team at the end of the project to say things that worked, so that's a smiley face, things that didn't work, any ideas or any appreciations for, for people in particular. And then you, uh, after that, you can do an exercise like start, stop, continue. So in the next project, you know what you need to change and to improve in your process. There are lots of activities. These are just, I think, two of my favorite ones. And in this one, this project as well, we, we also 
came back to the risks because at the beginning of the project we thought, okay, so what are the risks in, in this project? And the retrospective we uh, went back to them and thought, that in this case, it was just like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, you're right, yep, yeah, everything of these risks happened. So my, the th first thing I want to talk about is about communication. Because I think this is the biggest challenge when you talk about multidisciplinary teams and and having a team working well together. So I, I think about, in terms of verbal communication, I, I think about facilitator and leader ways of communicating. So the facilitator is someone who is a guide for the group and is as a neutral position in that meeting. So they are trying to get everyone to contribute to the discussions equally and, to and for them to assume the responsibilities. So when I was talking about the stakeholder workshop, that's, that was my role there, it was to facilitate that meeting. Whereas the leader is someone who leads the discussion and gives direction. So for example, when you are presenting some designs to, to a client, you need to, to lead that discussion. And as we come from different perspectives, we talk in different ways. So for example, a designer, because of the type of work, I think we tend to talk a bit more abstract than developers because of the type of work is more, more focused in the details. So, in terms of facilitator and, and leader language, the facilitator is, is, is more warm, like a, a warm language, like it's more neutral, is actively listening, and is passive and has an inclusive tone. So, you might say things like, how about, maybe we can, what if, we are including the other people in that conversation, that, in that idea. So this works well when it's like a, a briefing meeting with the client because the client needs to feel that they that you are listening to them before you, you come up with ideas. And also in brainstorming sessions, when you are as a designer, you're facilitating that that meeting with the project team, you want everyone to feel included. And the leader language is much more direct in what's called the muscular language. So you need to show confidence and you need, need to show that you're the expert. So you might say things like words like absolutely, complete, I completely agree, and this is my plan. It's much more direct. So this is very good when you're presenting uh, designs to clients because they, they want to feel that you're the expert. So you might need to be much more direct then if you're, if you're using the leadership, the leader, no, the facilitator language, which is much more open. So you need, to, to, you need people to trust your expertise. I've seen, when you're thinking about these two languages, I've seen it working quite badly when you use the opposite. So for example, in a briefing meeting, if you are very direct and very like using this language as a leader language, the client might feel that you're not listening to them. Or if you're presenting your designs and you are very open in what if, and the client, I've seen it, it's happening when the client is not feeling that you're the expert. So the way I feel is not one or the other, it's like every meeting is a constant check to see what should I do now? And in every meeting you use, you will balance out the two languages. And something important to think about is when you are giving feedback to a designer or to, the, I guess, to a developer as well, or I'm, I'm more focused on the designer side here, uh, and when you're, you're asking for feedback on a design, an idea you create. So the important thing when you're asking for feedback is that you state clearly where you are at with that design, with that idea, and what exactly you expect feedback on. 
So are you in the beginning of the project? This is this just a draft? Or is this a final piece of work? <laughs> and you need to ask clear questions because sometimes the feedback you receive can be, can be just you don't understand what that means. And that's when you ask very clear questions or can you be more specific about what you're trying to say? And explain the rationale for your decisions. So one thing that I do is uh, when I'm showing a design to, to someone, to a client or to someone in the team, is that I usually am the, the first to speak. Because what I want to do is explain what is what they're looking at and you know state clearly um, what I expect feedback on. And this focus the conversation into that feedback. In terms of giving feedback, it's also a constant exercise that I feel when I'm giving feedback to other designers, for example, or other people's idea. So if they haven't said yet, so we can ask for the current state, uh, status of the design. What am I looking at here? And an important thing is to question first and comment last. So it's very likely that the thing that you are thinking the designer already thought about. Because as a designer, everything that you are adding there, you are making a conscious decision for every element in that page or that design. And if you are a developer uh, giving feedback to a designer, explain the technical challenges. So if this is something that is not, if you see that it's not going to work, explain why. It's very important because as a designer, we need to understand what are the restrictions, what are the boundaries, so we can explore and sometimes go beyond and be creative about it. And don't refer to personal taste. So always refer to the briefing and to the user research. Like this is not applicable because in the briefing we're trying to do this, or the users won't you know, necessarily uh, use it this way. And this is one of my pet hates, actually. When I show a design and someone says, I don't like it. And in my mind is, I don't care. <laughs> because it's basically, it's personal taste, and it's not the point. So avoid, I don't like it, or can't do it, without even explaining why. And always go back to the briefing when you're giving feedback. So I'm going to play a video of um, Gar uh, Gary Leonidas, who is the associate professor at the University of Reading. I've interviewed him as part of a series of interviews I, I'm doing. And this one's about giving and receiving feedback. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I need to go back again. Yeah. So, the first thing you want to do when you're giving feedback is to break open that black box and try to figure out what are the criteria for making any judgment about something. And to do this, you have to take a step back and look at the brief for the project. So, there has to be a brief, it has to be understood and discussed by. The student. In this case, if there is a client involved, then that is a prototype. So, before we even start designing, you have a clear idea of what it is that you aim to achieve, and that will give you the criteria for judging this. So, is it something that has to just do a job? Is it something that has to make a statement? Is it something that has to reinforce an identity? Is it something that has to get a process to happen? These things will have their own criteria for evaluating. So, designers need to understand why. Why we, we can't build, build something, or why you are giving that feedback and get to the bottom of the problem. And there is also a joke about it, how designers approach things. So how many designers does it take to change a light bulb? Has anyone heard that? 
that it had to be a light bulb. <laughs> so this is our job. We look at the status quo, and we think, does it need to be this way? Can we change it? Can we make it better? In terms of giving um, feedback, there's a very good article about, it's called Give It Five Minutes. So I'm going to just read a quote about that from that article. He said, men, give it five minutes. It's fine to disagree, it's fine to push back, it's great to have strong opinions and beliefs. But give my idea some time to set in before you're sure you want to argue against them. Five minutes represented think, don't react. So this is very important when you're giving feedback. Because design has the power of creating emotions in people. And when you are responding to a, to a like you're giving your feedback about the design and you're respond, responding emotionally, it's not necessarily going to be very constructive. So if you stop and you think, and then think about the briefing, think about the user research, and then you feedback, it's much more constructive. So we, usually it's about 10 seconds, not five minutes, but, and silence is fine. If a designer asks you to look at the design and feedback, being silent, looking at it, is fine. Another article I really like is, um, is about negotiating, but when you're talking about ideas and communicating ideas, I see there is a relationship with this. So basically, if someone loses, you did it wrong. So when you're sharing ideas, it's not about, let's see which idea wins here. It's about getting to a, an agreement. And where both parties or everyone are buying in to that idea. It's very important that the developer are actually believes that, that, that the design is good, because it's going to make them work better. And it's, it's important that the designer understands any technical restrictions, so they can come up with better ideas. So I want both parties to understand and buy in, uh, in, in the, what is best, the best solution. It takes energy and it takes time, time to explain well. So, but what I learned is that you actually, I, I, this is something that I keep thinking, it's like, bother to explain. Bother to explain as much as is needed about what is your idea is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about communication tools, just some uh, tools that I have used and I think they're very good. One is GitHub, I'm sure the developers are using, but the, uh, the very good thing about it is that designers and managers can also use GitHub. So one of the ways of, I, I have worked before is uh, while it's in development, the developer might say, oh, this is missing some design in here, and then add me, and then I can come and join the conversation and say, upload an image of a design and say, how about this? And then the account manager who is looking after the client might come in with a business perspective and think, well, this might not work. So everyone is in that conversation in one place. And the same is with Jira. So this one, when you're talking about Jira and project managers using user stories, uh, like agile user stories, you can have everything in one place. So related to a user story that the developer is working on, you can upload some designs and you can have a conversation about it. And there is also like integration with a chat system, which is called, which is called if chat. And another one as well is Trello. Um, so this is a like Kanban board. And this is a, another way, another one that is very good for communication. So as you can see here, the bottom one is Greg, who is the developer saying, so there is something missing here, but that's one thing. When you're designing, you're not. It's impossible to think about all the possibilities. But there's a lot of things that comes from data, it comes from content. When once you start pulling those in, 
So in this one, he sends a, a screenshot, so I can, like in two minutes, I can create something, which is a, just a mock-up, and upload to that, to that system. So this, everything is everything there. And the whole team have access to it, including the client. And another one, which actually I haven't used because I heard uh, from people who works with people remotely, uh, we don't have much of remote people, but is uh, that is called um, is Quibble. So this is something like Skype, but the difference is that the faces and the videos are there. They they're, they're just there. If you tap or if you click on someone's uh, face, there it becomes a video. So it's almost like the idea of tap on the shoulder, stand up and go to someone, someone's desk. So that's what I wanted to share. But let's not settle in one way of working. Because we work with technology and it's always changing. So this process will change. And the important thing is that we keep meeting up, discussing, and improving our processes regularly. Thank you. And we have five minutes for questions, and for questions here. Hi, um, uh, I'm our team, our uh, great fans of Agile, <coughs> and me as well. Uh, but I have some practical questions or challenges. Uh, first of all, have you ever had the experience of forcing a uh, top manager, meaning uh, six or seven digit salary, to put anything on a post-it note uh, anywhere uh, across the globe? Because I haven't. Um, and uh, the, seven, uh, the second part is, uh, if everybody contributes actively to the UX while the UX is being done, isn't this against the agile methodology, which uh, um, should actually go for velocity and doing things in parallel so that you reach an MVP uh, faster? Yeah, okay. So the first question is getting top managers to put ideas and post it. Yeah. So that stakeholder workshop was actually top managers there. was two people from the client side that were quite top. So it does take a little bit of courage, like I'm going to say to someone who is much more senior than I am, and you know, to put ideas in post it. But you just need to do it. And and it works because once you have like a a group and you give directions, like you give some rules of this is the activity we're doing, they take part. No one's going to say, no, I'm not taking part in this. And the other question is about agile. Yeah, everybody taking part in the UX in the uh, US. because if everybody really takes part in the jobs done like this, uh, it's really difficult to manage and it's not needed. Yeah, so I think it's important that everyone's involved in the UX process because there are some projects that are really technical. So I've been working on projects that are that has so much data that it's impossible that I do the user research on my own because developers do need to, uh, to do need to understand the users and so they can come up with ideas as well. So there is a, a question about you know how can you allow budget for that, right? Because you do need several people coming to the user research. But that's it's more efficient because in the long term it's going to you're going to uh, not have problems that you would if they weren't involved in the process. Uh, first of all, thank you for this talk. It was, okay. it was really practical in my view. It's one of the most practical seen at conferences. So to one step uh, more on this, uh, you basically talked about uh, UX processing starting projects. What about uh, existing UX improvement? Maybe you can say your top three techniques that can be implemented straight away. So in terms of uh, you are redesign something, like some project that is already... Not necessarily, but just improving it. Yeah, so 
one of the techniques they stakeholders workshop as well, it was about improving uh, an app. So we had finished already, like the app was live, but we needed uh, to go to phase two, let's say, and see how that we can improve here. So this was a, a very good way of getting requirements and get the team to work together and think about, yeah, what can be improved. And something else is, as well is, once the project is live, it's a very good opportunity for you to observe users actually using the product. So observing is like not only going there and sit next to them, but it's gathering analytics and gather, gather any information you can at that stage. So it would be like, let's say, Google Analytics or running some interviews like after, after like a month that they are using, get like uh, representatives of different user groups and have a call with them or go there, meet them, have a chat, a one hour chat with them. And this is very, like you get lots of insights from it. Thank you. Oh, last question here. Hi, uh, it seems that design must be created before it can be implemented. So do you have any tips on making sure that creating the design is not a bottleneck for a team? So what does the team do while you're creating the design? Yeah, so in my experience, we try to reduce that amount of uh, design phase, like just to the essentials. So we don't get into a road where we're you know, designing, like, so if you go back some years ago, we used it to make prototypes that were very detailed prototypes. And the whole design was made up front. And then when it would go to developers, they would, okay, but this doesn't work. I have problems here. This would take me months to develop rather than a week if it was different. So what, what we do is we create uh, just high level wireframes and uh, user flows. So when it, it comes to actually look into the page and think, okay, what are the details about this page? That's when we work in parallel with the developer. So in terms of what they need to be doing during the design phase, uh, when, when it's a very complex application, they have lots of uh, stuff they need to do as well. Like they need to set up the environment, they need to uh, create systems design as well. They do have a design phase in another type of design, not interface, but they, I, that's what the way, the way we work. Because they do need to get like, data and where the data comes from. And at some point, we have data on the screen and we can then work in parallel. Thank you very much.